That's what we're looking for. I see it's because we've got a spotlight. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and pull that. Yes. Thank you for moving over because I was sitting in the spotlight position before that. <laughs> Actually, I Thank you. Uh, okay. um, so, what, what Matt was getting to at the end of, uh, of his presentation there was uh, there are also risks. There are also risks associated with um, with providing access to public data. And I'll give you an example for some of you, uh, Matt referred to it, but some of you might recall in the wake of the Sandy Hook uh, tragedy that there was a very, very um, uh, difficult discussion that was going on about the access to public records about handgun, people with handgun permits in downstate New York. And uh, some journalists in Westchester and I think in Rockland County and Suffolk County on the Hudson River actually got hold of uh, public public information, information that is uh, that is under legislation publicly available and started to convert that information into visual data that could be interpreted. So that meant that you could potentially go and look in your community and see if your neighbour or someone that you might be living next to had a legal handgun permit. Okay? So on its, on its own that seems like a fairly benign um, piece of information to actually have a hold of, but in the context of post Sandy Hook, that, that information was completely charged and loaded because a lot of people were looking at what the implications of understanding that information were, and there was a big debate, and actually there was a kind of a, an internal revolt amongst a lot of the county clerks in New York State who then said, we can see the implications of risk and danger in allowing people to mine this information and turn potentially, in that context, potentially pretty volatile information into, into a piece of visual data that people can interpret. So that would mean that, you know, you could get into, you would then know whether your, if your child was going to play at a school friend's house after school, whether there was actually a, there was actually a handgun permitted in that house. So I'm sure you can see the kind of implication. So I guess um, Catherine and I were talking about this a little bit um, off the record or before this event about, did you want to sort of comment about what you see as some of, you know, as a as a working journalist and someone responsible for news, Catherine, what you, you know, how you would see some of the potential risks associated with, you know, mining public data in a way that, you know, th that also could, you know, can generate problems as, as much as Civic would? Sure. Hello, hello. Okay, I'll try this one. There we go. Um, well, as you all were um, alluding before, you know, just because you can get numbers and lots of them um, doesn't mean those folks who can get those numbers know what to do with them um, in a responsible way as journalists. And that's why the collaboration is, is important, I think. Um, you know, I think as a working journalist, we face these decisions every day in, in small ways and large ways. Um, of what information should be put out to the public, what's appropriate, what's ethical, that sort of thing. Um, and it can be in the smallest ways or in this very large example that, that Matthew just brought up. And I think that's why it's really important, even in this um, new media age, where anyone can have a website that they can call a news and information website, um, but it's very important to keep trained journalists um, in these ethical issues in what is responsible journalism. Um, and everyone has their own version of that, and there is a place at the table for a wide spectrum of journalists, I firmly believe that. Um, but as consumers, you have to know, um, you know who you believe and trust and who you don't. And I think we're here um, at Public Radio, we pride ourselves of have, taking the opportunity to take a little more time at putting our stories together and before we put things on air. We're, we're not 24-hour news. Um, you know, for that reason, so that we can, you know, make our decisions and our judgments very carefully. Um, but I'll tell you, I used to work for 24-hour news, and sometimes you have to make decisions quickly, and sometimes you make wrong decisions. And, you know, the most important thing is, I think, for journalists is to think through what sort of data and information gets out there, and to, you know, really have your argument in place for why you did it, and the, the um, example you know, that Matthew brought up is a perfect one. There are arguments on both sides um, to the having that information. You know, as a, a parent, some people might like to know where there are, are guns. Um, you know, just like, you know, sex offender registries, um, you know, that's an important public service. Um, but, you know, knowing where guns are, you know, a lot of people 
believe that's the Second Amendment, that's your right, and no one needs to know your business. And we saw that clearly through Upstate, that a lot of people protested that, and that's, you know, in my opinion, their right to believe that. Um, but I think that's why, you know, partnering the data with the journalistic um, evaluation and analysis is, is really important. Dan, um, I might ask you this question, which is, um, is it important to draw a distinction between um, where data might be used as a kind of a tool at the back end of a story for a journalist and, and when it might be something that's kind of important to get out into the public domain? I mean, do you see a distinction or are you just saying, okay, this is public information, we're, we're creating a tool to understand it, it should be open to everyone? I mean, that's a tough one, but I think, I mean, the way I look at it is um, a lot of this data is out there, right? If you see it when you, whenever you're, if you're looking to buy a house, you can look up almost anything about that house and the homeowner even, you know, that you want to, and you can connect the dots on your, you know, on your own. Uh, for example, I found out that the person who was selling me my house uh, had been, uh, had a, a ticket for using cell phone while driving. And like, I, it was just like, it just like showed up in, uh, you know, when I was searching around, it's like, Okay, well, if that if I was you know, that you know me as someone who's searching uh, around you know as a, as an individual person, I, I mean I can find out so much about any of you. You know, look at Facebook, or, or sorry, Facebook graph search. It's kind of scary what you can find out about people. Um, but yeah, I think just that's just, just Google yourselves, just Google yourself. it, or just Google yourself. Yeah. Uh, but that's I think that the real uh, what makes you know the media or you know journalism slightly different is that. You're really putting a spotlight on that, and you're getting it out to a larger audience. So um, I think the larger your audience is, the more responsibility you have. That people actually give you that responsibility. They expect you to be more responsible with the power you have. Right. Uh, so you're putting something on public radio. You would never actually you repeat that. Although I should point out that actually showed up in a Syracuse.com story, which kind of surprised me. <laughs> right. Particular uh, you know issue. Um, so you know I, I think. Uh, in an age when anybody can be, anybody has an audience. I think that would be, you know, that's something that in a group like Hacks and Hackers, I think it's good to, you know, almost take the big J out of that journalism question and, 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 and talk about things like, you know, how many people are going to be exposed to this piece of information and start to think, of, think through how they're going to, uh, how they're going to interpret it. Well, the implications of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a dissenter back here. <laughs> Should you always assume you're going to get a large audience? I mean, just because you had 20 people this week doesn't mean your story is going to blow up. So, should you always be assuming you're going to be reached by millions? You know, yes. with, with the data being out there, yes, you should. But in terms of if you're putting a story together, or in the case of that um, that you know gun owners map, that was placed. It was embedded into a story from a journalist talking about right. And so, and so. They're providing more context and guiding people through the information and making some uh, some connections for the audience, and then they kind of missed. They, they stopped, and then suddenly it's like, okay, now just go through here and find out which of your neighbors has a gun. And it didn't matter what the journalist said in that story after that point. Everyone's just searching to see does my next neighbor have a neighbor have a gun. So you have to kind of think through what's someone going to do once they click on that button within this. You know that this story. I think the context matters a lot. And building on Dan's last point, since um, the reason I brought up the map is not so much because I think the map in and of itself would necessarily be a bad idea. It's actually the implementation of it. And a question that should have been asked was: Was there any reason to actually put individual addresses on that map versus a heat map or something else to visualize to give an idea of the density of the gun ownership in an area with? Or, or excuse me, it's not even gun ownership. We should. No, it's gun permit registration because there's no tracking of gun ownership. I can add, what's a heat map? Yeah, a heat map. So um, if anybody can like picture uh, an infrared look at the body or or anything along those lines, or actually even a, a Doppler radar weather map, it's one that shows the intensity of, let's say, rainfall or anything based on shifting colors in an overlay, which could have told the exact same the exact same thing and powerfully added to the story and actually not undercut things. Which gets to, um, I think, one of the great challenges, and especially a challenge um, that I think an organization like Hacks and Hackers can contribute to uh, Innovation Trail or a public media station that doesn't necessarily have these resources, is 
to do good data work that shouldn't come in at the end of the story is to whatever degree is possible, that actually should be where the story begins. And so the ability to, to have resources within the area, and again, this gets back to the connections that are built through hacks and hackers and similar organizations to try and get to that data earlier, those data questions early, to get reporters to say, gosh, you know, I, like uh, we said with those two, uh, the people we worked with from the DNC is like, I know on some level there's a story in this database. I don't know how to get to it. Can you help me even start that process? Is that's as important in some ways as it is to build that heat map at the end or or a, a sexy visualization? But interestingly enough, that's also some of the the, the the type of finding material that hackers really like to work with to try and say like I think there's a needle in that haystack. How do I get to it? And I think that that's one of those points that we found where journalists and the interest of journalists and hackers really cross over really beautifully. I just add really quick. I think that uh, the, the software developers also need to be, and the designers, yes. other people who are part of that, that you know, the, 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 they're out there getting the data, they need to be seen as reporters and storytellers, mm -hmm. right? And working right alongside them. And I think that when they're all working on these together from the beginning, yes. And it's not just something that's passed on to another department or group and then, okay, we need a visualization, we need some data, plop it in. That's where you run into problems. Yeah. Well, and just to answer your question from earlier, I would say anytime you're quote unquote publishing anything, which in these days is radio, web, newspaper, television, anytime it's getting out there in the public, even if your blog only has two followers, you know, you need to consider what you're putting on there and you need to make it as accurate as possible and think through what you're putting on there. You know, the old adage of, you know, want to, you know, have, a, have anything in the newspaper that you don't want your grandmother to know that you did. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so that, that would be, you know, my first point. And to what you were just talking about, I think, um, you know, data is used by journalists in two different ways, at the front end and the back end. You come up with great story ideas um, from data. Um, the census is one that comes up. You get story ideas from continually with the census providing data, um, not, every, not just every 10 years, but they provide it throughout, you know, all the time. Um, I mean, you know, to come up with a really basic idea, a basic example, this is from when I was in grad school that some of the non journalists in the room might understand. I was in graduate school in Springfield, Illinois, and it's the state capital. And I noticed one of the weirdest things that it seemed like everybody had a personalized license plate. And, but I just had that feeling. I didn't know that for sure. And it was an assignment one day, but you have 30 minutes to go get a story. So I went out to the largest parking lot that was nearby and just counted the personalized license plate and counted the cars. And it was something like 40% of them had personalized license plate. It was huge. But I needed numbers to tell the story to prove my point because I just had a hunch. Yeah. I didn't know if I was right or wrong. So that's like the most basic example of, you know, taking some data and, you know, proving your point. Um, so the story, you know, the data is useful at the beginning and at the end. You come up with story ideas and you use them to help prove what you, you think is going on. You may have anecdotal evidence of, from folks you've talked to. You may have come up with a story at a city council meeting, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so there's a lot of ways data can be used. And, and the, the, other part of, the other part of this, and the reason why we're kind of having this discussion too is that it's in it's in a lot of government agencies interest to present information in a way that makes it very difficult to interpret it so for example at the simplest level that can mean that when they publish their statistics on your local school district budget they don't actually present it to you as an excel spreadsheet which is a a kind of way of that you could actually filter and interpret and slice and dice that information they'll give, they'll give it to you as a pdf which is a, a fixed asset it's a fixed file you can't you can't move them around, you can't put them into a table, you can't check their arithmetic. Um, and there's some very sort of quite strong examples out there of just, you know, at a very simple level of if you, if you, if you actually put, you know, the budget of a school district into a spreadsheet and, and check it against the numbers that they've given you, that they don't actually add up. <laughs> so at a very simple level, you could, that's new data as well, not at the kind of the spectacular level of, you know, beautiful interactive graphics and all that kind of stuff, but that's another kind of, that's another kind of level of it. Um, and just sorry, just one. The other thing I'd say is just that it's it's very important. Um, you know, who knows what the biggest killer of uh, what what's the the um, 
the highest cause of death for people aged between the years 2 and 14 would be. Just have a guess what it would be. Car accidents. Car accidents, right. It's actually the biggest killer of people aged between 2 and 44 years old is car accidents. But the way that the Centers for Disease Control actually present the information, they present it to you as if it's the biggest killer of people aged 2 to 14, which it is. But it's also the biggest killer of people aged 2 to 44. And there is a, there is a difference in, in, the, in how you can interpret that piece of information. And that's the kind of stuff that you get into when you get to the raw data. Because at one end, they've got a spokesperson or an expert who's putting a spin on the information. And at the back end, there's actually some raw information that you want to try and get a handle on. And that's what journalists are there to do in the public service for, you know, for the audience, too. Just building up at that point, um, with the uh, Monroe County Safety Feed and the Onondaga one that Tim showed it just a little bit earlier, even though the front end looks very much the same on that, he was able to reuse most of his effort on one to the other. On the actual back end stuff, I think, Tim, you were saying it took you six hours to recode the feeds to do exactly what Matthew's describing. So just because you would even do it in come up with an answer for one locality, Rochester doesn't mean it's going to be able to be immediately applied down the street in Syracuse. Or when you talk about school districts, as uh, Chris Horn, who's another one of our, our members here, can tell you, it's like one school district may release in Excel, another one may release in PDF, another one may just put it up on the web, another one you have to get papers from, and even the values across any of them are not the same reporting values. So we get into these issues of all of the data work that, again, even though they say all well, our data is available, it actually isn't, or it isn't in a way that actually allows for good reporting. And so that's one of those things that immediately can grind stuff to a halt. Could I just, I want to leave room for eating and for drinking. Um, <laughs> but uh, questions, sorry, Chet, I had a question. Um, so the, the federal government now has this open data policy. How effective is that? And then more to the point of innovation trail, um, is the state following along? Are they having statewide um, data that's that's leading to innovation trail stories? I, I can part of the chip mark and then More data is always good. There's not enough. <laughs> Are they doing an effective job yeah, though? Uh, they 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 and actually, I'm, I kind of turned to uh, one of the other people up from Rochester, Remy DeCosmaker, who's been very involved in state public data, and I think he's the one who can really give you the best answer to that question. He's been living this for the last few years. So hi there, everybody. Um, I would say that um, since the Open Government Memorandum came out in 2008, um, that basically mandated that every agency, and I might get the numbers wrong, sorry, um, they basically have to put out about five data sets a year, I believe it was, and most of the agencies were meeting that requirement. And the new open data standards that came out said that not only do they need to be open, but they also need to be in machine-readable format. Yeah. So that is going to be huge because that's the exact problem we were just talking about, right? PDFs are not machine-readable. The whole deal with Monroe Minutes is to make PDFs machine-readable. As soon as we do that, we can build some nice wrappers around them what we'll call legacy architecture for reporting data, so that it doesn't matter how it sits, we can also put a layer over the top of it. I would also add at the state level, um, at least in New York State, um, the New York State Senate is really leading the way when it comes to New York open data, and that model is being emulated other places. They just released version 3.0 of the Open Legislation API. I just got the release notes like last week. Um, now you can get transcripts, you can get bill notes, you can get votes. Um, it's very good, it's restful, it comes in a number of formats, JSON, XML, um, things that coders are really like. So, New York is doing an all right job. Uh, we did lose some ground in places like the New York State Temporary Commission on Ethics and Lobbying, where some of the data sets disappeared. Um, so it's give and take, but for the most part, um, New York City is doing an all right job when it comes to things like legislation, bills, votes. Uh, we're still working on campaign finance, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I, whether or not it's actually led to you know individual innovation trail stories, um, you know some of the folks who've been in it as well as I could probably answer that. But I agree with you know with what you said. More data is good. Um, the problem we're faced with journalism these days is, as everyone knows, um, the number of working journalists for you know 
organizations is shrinking all the time and we're all faced with deadline pressures. And this is because of what we're talking about right here, journalists often don't have time to comb through huge amounts of, of data and what you're talking about before, the sort of data dump by the government, which typically happens at 4 p.m. on Friday. <laughs> Um, when everyone wants to go home. Um, you know, I've been on receiving end where I've had bosses say, okay, you find someone to go through, you know, the whole entire 2010 census, you know, but they also have to produce a live shot every single hour. You know, it just, uh, it just doesn't work. You know, you just can't do everything. And data um, mining, and which we, in my day, we just called research, um, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. It takes concentrated time, which we don't always have as journalists. And that's why I'm really pleased, like, the idea of putting all the school minutes, um, you know, school board minutes on a website is fantastic because we all relied on local newspapers to cover every single, you know, school district, and that's just not happening anymore. And that's not something that you know we can fulfill with public radio. Um, so to have you know an independent group put that out on the web somewhere where everyone can go and look at it more easily is fantastic. Come on, so we have a question. Isn't that where uh, crowdsourcing is coming really valuable? Potentially. Yeah. I, I would say potentially. Although it can go really wrong too, right? Yeah. If you look at what happened with uh, the Boston, Boston. Yeah, the, uh, the Boston Marathon, yeah. you know, the people were basically trying to, to crowdsource the FBI. That didn't work so well. But I think in a lot of cases, if it's if it's managed well from the top, it can, it can be effective. Actually, this question is sort of for you. Could you sure. talk a little bit about the how you, the Innovation Trail reporting system is structured? You have all these reporters from different stations, so how are they coming up with story ideas, and how do you decide what you're going to pursue, and mm -hmm. so forth? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the question was really about what the sort of the vision of the reporting project is, um, and the answer is that the kind of the parameters of so we have um, uh, seven reporters across six upstate New York public broadcast affiliates. Uh, they're all working out of their own newsrooms or their own bedrooms, depending on what station they're working for. Um, we have seven reporters because the North Country has two part-time reporters because the Adirondacks is obviously a big region. So they decided to um, work with two part-time reporters to get some ge geographical kind of um, spread. Um, and the, the kind of topics that we covered were laid out um, back when the project started almost three years ago, which was to look at what happens when the legacy um, industries of upstate New York depart, what's the back, what moves into the vacuum that's created when you lose you know, a Kodak or a carrier or you know, that, kind of, that kind of manufacturing infrastructure. Um, so um, since then it's, it's definitely transformed and morphed and kind of tried to meet the needs of the individual partner stations. So you've got very, very different kinds of newsroom cultures. Um, if you're in the Adirondacks, you've got a different sort of agenda to what's going on in Buffalo, obviously, because you, you've got the rural-urban sort of um, divide, for one thing. Um, it's a mixture of both reporters pitching stories based on their local, monitoring the local knowledge. It's a matter of input from me as the editor, and it'll also be um, a kind of some prescriptions that we put in place to be able to collaborate around certain topic areas that we think are kind of... Um, of the moment. So for example, we did a whole lot of work on innovation in healthcare delivery last late last year because we saw we started to realise there were a whole bunch of stories that, that people were working on to do with different ways that healthcare was being delivered through e-records online, different practitioner models, different uses of technologies to help kind of streamline health healthcare delivery. Um, we just did a whole lot of work on innovation in agriculture because there was an enormous amount going on within the agricultural sector. So it's a kind of a mix of um, externally imposed, grant imposed um, uh, editorial guidelines and a kind of a backwards and forwards dialogue between the editor and input from the reporters and the, and the news directors. Um, and going forward, we're probably going to broaden that brief a little bit more. We felt that, I think, you know, when we met recently to talk about the project and where it was going to go, we sort of felt that there were was a real need to step into some social issues reporting areas that we felt we hadn't been able to do because of the way in which we've been funded. You know, we sort of signed a contract with the CPB to say we're going to do manufacturing, right? So now we're sort of being, seeing that there's an opportunity to step in and to address some other kinds of issues um, that that will probably make the project a little bit broader in scope than it's been. Still with the kind of focus around the transition, the kind of a, an upstate community in transition in many ways, but with um, the opportunity to step into some other sort of story areas.
One more question you wanted to yeah, come. I, ju I just wanted to comment on the crowdsourcing. <coughs> that from a success story standpoint, so with Monroe Minutes, one of the biggest problems is making this generic program that can go on any website and find all the meeting minutes. That's super, super typical, right? That like you can just dispatch on any website. So to make it a little bit simpler, you just need a list of all of the websites where they keep their meeting minutes. Right? So you go to you know, government, meeting notes, minutes, right? So I just said to all my friends and family, why don't you guys go on, here's the list, find those, and then just email me the links, right? So it's very, very pointed. It was very successful, and I was able to make the, the program a lot simpler because of that. And it was, you know, it, I mean, shaved off. Could have been 100 plus hours, yeah, just from the success side. Of <laughs> There's a lot of negative side. One more question before we round it up, and then we have, obviously there'll be an opportunity to, to to network and talk. Off. You want to get more technical? God knows. I'm sure these guys want to talk about technical I stuff. I have a question for all of you. Okay, sure. I'll just take this gentleman's comment and then back to Dan, and then we'll wrap up. Yes, sir. Could you give me an example or two of stories where you have collaborated, where you've gotten the information and then it became a new story that we heard on the air? Well, we haven't collaborated yet in that way, but this is the beginning of, you know, hopefully something that, that we can do more of. Um, I think maybe you've collaborated well, actually, with um, others. I was going to uh, point to you, Randy actually um, did work with uh, Rich Ward, uh, and I don't know if it was for WRXXI or the Innovation, or it was specifically Innovation Trail, it was Innovation Trail, uh, on election coverage uh, a few years ago. This was technically before Hacks and Hackers had begun, it was in, in the same sort of project where they were doing uh, real-time uh, election reporting on a number of issues, uh, and essentially they had set up a control room at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology where they were sorting through uh, a lot of data that was being released in real time in not a particularly easy to consume format, especially for anything that was for lower ticket items um, below the major races. And so um, the framework that they established has then been used uh, for report. I'm, I'm getting, was that two or three? We're up to three counties now. Yeah, so three counties worth of information is now being handled that way. And, I think um, one of the things that was amazing for me to find out, especially with elections in this area, is how non-wired so many... <laughs> Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know, but it, it was still like understanding that um, I, I had a discussion with um, a, a, a news, news reporters that were basically like, we have to have a person at every counting space if we want to be able to report on it that night, because Otherwise, it might be a day or two before we find it. So you can speak to that a lot better than I can. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we came across that with the last election, and you know, the, all the counties that we cover, the many counties, and you know, some of them have online information that's updated regularly, and some of them, well, they have one person kind of updating their website, and some of them you have to call, and some of them you have to go there the next day. Um, so it's it's a wide variety of things, and I think you'd find this all over the country too. That um, you know it just is is a big you know difference. I mean, we just ran a story today that you know the New York legislatures, um, you know, finally going digital with everything rather than printing copies of every bill. You know, and um, they're one of the, the last states to do that. Um, but you know, it's it's a process, and you know, in these times of budget, sometimes that's not the priority. Their priority, their job is to count the ballots and declare a winner, do it accurately. It's not necessarily to tell us immediately. Um, you know, so their first job is not always to tell us, and you know, our job is just to bug them so we can tell you. <laughs> Dan, did you have a final comment? Yeah, well, I was kind of curious. So, um, looks like maybe, what, about 50 people here? Or a little more? Yep. So how many of you are, or would consider yourselves to be a journalist? This one. How, how about programmers? Okay, and then the rest of you listeners or, or fans of the cover. Okay, um, I mean that, that's a great mix, right? So yep. what I what I think is great about uh, groups like this is that there are people like everyone's interested in the same goal, right? Having a more informed society and having more information out there because you know we all live in these communities, so I think we should all. Yeah, and, and, I think they, and, and uh, talk about how we can work together. Yeah, and I think, uh, Matt, yeah, just quickly. Yeah, just uh, very quickly. One of the things, um, just to point out with that, in fact, um, 
it's it's important to understand about hacks and hackers, and a lot of, and the goal of these organizations is it's not to turn journalists into programmers, it's not to turn programmers into journalists. And in fact, even when we're speaking about hackers, I actually like the term makers much better because it, it, it's a much more inclusive term. It gets into a lot of forms of, uh, of innovation that are not sometimes seen. But for as much as we've, I've been saying hacker and hacker, I, I'm, thank you for the nods out there, uh, what it really meant to say is maker and maker. And there are a lot of ways to participate groups like hacker, hacks and hackers and again, more than just journalists, also storytellers, people who are interested in creating content, um, that there are real opportunities there. And so part of the goal is not simply to make us more insular, but it's to forge those connections, to help educate, to get you know, new ideas and new voices. And I think that's the other thing I'd say is just that there's a role for everyone in this conversation. With if you're in healthcare or education, then there's a role for you. It's not it's not a it's not defined by vocation or by specialist skill because that's that's kind of that process of engagement is really what what I think we're sort of pointing to. Well, let's finish up the formal part. Michael, would you like to just make any closing remarks, and then please feel free. We're all going to be.